Welcome back to The Learning Curve, the series where you get to watch me stumble through scale modeling. On this week's episode, I'll be figuring out chipping fluid and rusty tracks. Stay tuned to watch how I painted this Tamiya Leopard 1 in a winter camo scheme. This mold is originally from 1969, and honestly, I can barely tell. The details and surface textures are better than on some of the more recently made kits that I've built. One of the details I don't like though are the tow cables. They're rubbery plastic and they don't look very good. They seemed like a pretty simple thing to improve on, so I'm making some replacement cables out of copper wire, and then I'm using some heat shrink tubing to attach the shackles. Be careful when you're heating up the shrink tube because it can melt the plastic. I managed to do that a little bit on one of these shackles, but we can fix it later. I've seen people using copper wire for this before, but this was my first time trying it out. It wasn't very time consuming, but the results are much better than what's provided in the kit. Next, I get the tank commander ready for painting. Just gotta pop them off the sprue and drill a hole into the figurine so I can hold it easier when it comes time to paint. I start the hole off with a hobby knife, and then I take a pin vise to it to finish it up. This just lets me put them on a little skewer so it's easier to paint. And then finally, this kit didn't come with a mantlet cover, so I tried making my own out of aluminum foil. I just glued it down with super glue, and then I went around it with a copper wire to add some extra detail. I could have gone even further detailing this, but this was very time consuming, and when it gets painted up, I think the results are fine. Now that I'm done fixing up those details, it's time to lay on some primer. This time I'm using MIG One Shot, the old one with the yellow cap. People say it's just rebottled Stylin Res, and if that's the case, that's probably the only primer I'm going to buy from here on out. This is by far the best primer I've used. It blows the Vallejo stuff that I was using before out of the water. It goes down way more smoothly, and it works great. I was having a lot of issues with Vallejo sputtering and leaving an uneven finish, so I tested it at a bunch of different PSIs, and I even tried diluting it. But at the end of the day, this MIG one shot gave way better results with almost no effort. I jammed some Q-tips into these road wheels to make them easier to hold while I was painting, and then I just cut slits in that cardboard box so I could stick them in there while it was drying. And with everything painted black, I do the pre-highlights. I'm using MIG one shot white here, and just like the black, it went on great. The point of this is to give the base layer that'll go on top of this highlights and shadows. I'm focusing the white on high points that would be exposed to direct overhead light. For the base coat here, I'm using Vallejo Model Air. Normally I would dilute this paint, but this time I just tried spraying it at a higher PSI. I think it's set to about 30 PSI here, and I'm using a 0.3 millimeter tip. Before this, I was spraying it around 20 PSI with the diluted paint. The process definitely went faster with the paint straight out of the bottle. I got better coverage and didn't need as many layers to get the opaque base coat that I was looking for. And it was also super convenient just to be able to pour it straight out of the bottle into the airbrush. A lot of the advice I read online typically recommends 18 to 20 PSI when you're airbrushing acrylics. I've just never found that to be true. Maybe the regulator on my compressor is inaccurate, but if I'm spraying this Vallejo straight out of the bottle like it's designed to be, 20 PSI just isn't enough. My advice as someone who's still new to this, to other people who are struggling with airbrushing, if it's not performing the way that you're expecting, mess around with it. Experiment with different thinners, different PSI, different needle sizes. There's a lot of really good info on the internet, but a lot of the time you have to learn stuff through experience. And here's that base coat all done. So the first step with tracks is to paint them in a medium gray. This is gonna be the base coat for all the rust effects. I've done tracks like this once before, but the results weren't really what I wanted, so I decided to give it another shot. This time, I think they turned out great. If you have any advice, tips, or tricks, or anything I should try in the future, leave me a comment below. So starting off with the rust effects, it's gonna be a bright rust orange. I diluted this pretty heavily with Tamiya X20A acrylic thinner. Last time I tried this technique, I used water and it took forever to dry and I way over diluted it. So this time I just stuck with thinner. So you do that first layer with that bright rust orange over the whole track and then you just get progressively darker. I did four different shades of acrylics 
and I would just add more brown to the orange. And then for the final color, I just added a drop of black. With each successive color, speckle less and less of it onto the tracks. And then once I do the four acrylic colors, I do three different enamel washes the same way, going from lightest to darkest and putting less and less on the tracks as I go. The enamel washes are really thin, so they leave nice little specks and give visual variety. Once all those rust colors are dried, I go over each individual track pad with black paint. This is a mix of matte black and just a little bit of engine gray. You don't want it to be pure black or else it looks like a toy. It just looks really fake. This is a pretty tedious, repetitive, time-consuming process, but once it's all over, it's nice to look at. And with the rust and the track pads done, I just go over these center guides with some metallic paint. These would be rubbing on the road wheels and wouldn't be able to rust. The road wheels get the same matte black treatment as the rubber pads. Road wheels can be tedious, it's just super repetitive, but once you get in the groove, you can blast through it, and it, it's actually kind of fun. I really like watching the paint just kind of glide over. You can see I'm rotating the road wheel as I'm stroking the paintbrush. Leaves a nice even finish. You want to make sure to get the outside edge of the rubber as well. This can be pretty tricky, and it requires some attention to detail and steady hands, but practice makes perfect. You can see here I'm just rotating the wheel. It's easier than trying to take really long strokes. And then I just do that 15 more times. This next step is the point of no return. The base coat's looking really nice and I'm about to try a lot of things that I haven't done before. I'd be lying if I said I wasn't nervous to start painting this camouflage. I really didn't want to have to strip this back to bare plastic so I used some spoons and did a lot of testing. Here I'm just using some blue tack that I rolled out with a wine bottle to mask the first layer. I wanted the white layer to have kind of soft edges to replicate a thinly applied whitewash. And I'm basing the camo pattern off of reference photos that I found of Norwegian leopard ones. I used the diagrams in the back of the instruction manual and just kind of drew on the pattern to have a blueprint to work off of. And then before I put any paint down, I'm just applying chipping fluid with a brush. I tested ammo and Vallejo chipping fluids through the airbrush. I tried them straight out of the bottle, diluted 10, 20, 30, 40 PSI, but nothing I did gave me consistent results. So I just brushed it on. I let it dry for about 30 minutes and then I painted on the white. I gave the paint about 30 minutes to dry and then I pulled the masking off. From my tests, I found 30 minutes to be appropriate for this Vallejo Model Air paint. If you don't let it dry long enough, it will just fall off in clumps and you'll just be wiping wet paint around with a brush. The blue tack leaves some residue, so I just ball it up and use it like a rubber eraser. And now I start the chipping process. It's just a wet brush and I wet the paint and go at it. It's pretty fun, but you have a lot less control than you do with brush chipping. I use Q-tips and these mini applicators and a paintbrush to make scratches and different effects. And it's looking pretty rough right now, but this next layer is going to fix it up. First some matte clear to seal all those chipped layers in, and then I mask off the areas that are going to be black. I used masking tape for these because I wanted hard edges for the black, and then I overlapped some of the white, but I left some of the green exposed in other areas. Again, I'm just going off of reference photos. The black parts of the camo scheme looked like they were in better shape, and the edges weren't soft but the white paint looks to flake off pretty easily. And then another 30 minutes, let the paint dry and I can pull the masks off. And now I'm ready to start chipping those black areas. The black paint was a lot harder to chip. I don't know if it's because I used less of the chipping fluid or if it was the material that the paint was made out of, but it came off in much smaller, finer bits. I tried to focus these chips on hard edges and raised areas, places that would see more wear. These chips were a lot more fine and I was more conservative with them than on the white paint. And then I just used this piece of poster board that I cut out to mask off some areas and do some small touch-ups. I'm just cleaning up some of the overspray. 
And then the final trick that kind of ties all this together is a layer of blue enamel wash. This is MIG Productions blue for dark gray. I diluted it with white spirits and I made sure not to have too much on the brush when I was going over the model. I'm not trying to turn everything blue. I just want to tone down the warm hues and bring out some of the cooler ones. And I think that this did a great job of that. When you look at photos and videos of wintertime scenes, they tend to be very cool in color temperature. And this blue wash helps give the model some of that cool feeling. This is my first time doing a filter over an entire model like this. And I think that it ended up looking really good. Everything sort of came together. It helped even out all the different tones. Since I'm using this enamel filter, I'm gonna have to make sure that I varnish the whole model with an acrylic before I do any panel lines or pin washes so that it doesn't reactivate this layer. You can see here on this infrared searchlight how the blue filter just slightly adjusts the temperature of that white. And here it is, the Tamiya Leopard 1 painted in a rough winter camo scheme. Make sure you tune in next week to watch me finish this model. There's a lot more detailing and weathering that needs to happen before I can call this thing complete. I also picked up some cool new products and techniques that I can't wait to try out and share with you guys. As always, thanks for watching.